Every day, our grandson, when he's not sick, and he's sick a lot, our youngest grandson is two years old. And I get to, I walk down the hallway, and I go pick him up at daycare, and we spend some time in the foyer, 10 or 15 minutes before Jennifer comes and picks him up. And we have a little snack, and, and we, he has some Wawa, and we spend some grandfather, grandchild t- time that I just value. Believe it or not, I give him a little snack, and every once in a while I'll say, hey, can I have a bite? And he will say, no. It's, what will he say, two-year-old? He, he will say, it's mine. And I'll say, you little goober. I gave it to you. I can give you more. But isn't that what we do to God? He's given us all, everything, and he says, Hey, will you share with me? Will you bring to me? And we say, It's mine. Now this morning I want to share with you three three financial questions that will transform you for the better forever. And I'm sharing something from my heart to your heart. T- take it as you will. But I just truly, truly believe this is very important for every Christian to understand. And the first question, the first transforming question is this. Who owns it? Who really owns it? Now in Haggai chapter 2, verse 8, Haggai writes this. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The God owns it all. And then Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 26, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything is God's. And finally, in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11, he says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. God says, it's mine. And he shares with you and I. And it's important to realize. And and you say, well, I have two thumbs. I get up every morning. I work every day. I've earned it. I've invested it. I've worked hard. And you have. But we've got to realize that everything is from Him and everything is for Him. And He has given us the ability. Because you know what, he, what He's already written and He's already said this. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 17 18. This is a warning. Beware lest you say in not my heart, your heart, my power and, and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. That we've earned it and we deserve it. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth, that He may confirm His covenant that He swore to your fathers as it is this day. What He's saying here is that God has given us the ability. We are blessed of God, and it all comes from Him. So you've got to ask yourself, who owns it? Is it God or is it me? And we've got to determine in our lives that it's God's. You see, when we acknowledge God's ownership, every spending decision becomes a spiritual decision. Now, that's not my words. This comes from Larry Burkett. And and Larry Burkett, years and years ago, started Crown Ministry. In fact, he's not even alive today. And it changed my life. And it stopped me in a heartbeat. And it made me change. Now, did I like it? Absolutely not. Some of you may be uncomfortable right now. And I get that because that's where I was. But when I heard it, it burned into my heart and in my life. And I I had to ask myself this ownership question. Whose is it? The second question was this. Who am I putting first? Who am I putting first in my life? Now, it is a, a theological discrepancy considering putting God in any other place than first place. Now, let, let me say, if you're in this room today and if you're watching online, 
you've already decided that for this time period, you're going to put God first. And, and if you're in this room, you've chosen to go out into the cold, walk through the parking lot, and sit yourself down in this room and gather. And we are grateful. In fact, somebody was complaining we ran out of bulletins today. And I said, praise God. Amen? I heard some... And, and so you've already determined to put God first in this time slot. And that, I believe, is important. And, and we've got to realize in our hearts, for most of us, money is the number one competitor with God for our hearts. It is. And that's the challenge. And, and Jesus said you can't serve God and serve money. You're going to have to choose which one you're serving. So you need to ask yourself, who am I serving? In other words, you can't be a fully devoted follower of Jesus without putting God first in this area of your life. So how do we do that? What's the principle? And, and let me just say, it's, it's a tithe. It's a tithe. You see, a tithe in the Hebrew, the word is masur, and, and, and it's the first tenth. It's the ten percent. Now, God through Malachi, in Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 says, bring the whole tithe. Bring the whole tithe. Now, if you'll notice, he uses the word bring, and then every time we see these passages, you will see that God says bring instead of give. And we've got to understand that the reason why he says bring instead of give is because if God is true the owner and we're not the owner, then we're just bringing to God what is God's already, if we understand that. We really don't, I don't really have a title on my car, I don't have a mortgage on my house, it's God's. I don't have stuff in my garage and in my barn, it's God's. I'm just using what God has provided for me, and I'm just managing it. So the question then is, where do I bring it? Where do you bring it? And I would say, I would, I would say that this storehouse idea is the modern church of today. And, and you're saying, well, you know, Chris, all you're doing is preaching to increase the church's budget and the church's spending. Listen, I don't care how well we're doing or how well we're not doing. It, this is about you and not about it. And if you don't trust me or don't trust our church leadership, then I would encourage you to give somewhere, to bring your tithe somewhere else where you do. Because you are missing the blessing that God has in store for you. Because this, this is a life transformative principle that God wants to bless. And by the way, do you want to go to a church where you are nourished? Do you want to go to a church where you are nourished, where you are fed, where your life is transformed by the Word of God? And let me just tell you this, that there are churches all across America right now that are closing, that are struggling, because people aren't doing what they should, and the churches aren't nourishing, therefore they are not existing. And this is, this is unbelievable. This is unprecedented in our history, in the history of the United States. It's changing right now. And I believe as we obey God and we follow his word, we will be vibrant, we will be changed, we will be nursed, and we will be nourishing. And that's because of what God is doing, not because of what man is doing. In Leviticus chapter 27, verse 21, Moses writes this, we believe, but the field when it is released in the jubilee shall be a holy gift to the Lord like a field that has been devoted. You see, the idea is what the Lord's is devoted already, and when we bring that to the Lord, then that is just returning what he has given to us because he has only lent it to us and we are only managing it. Now I've had friends borrow stuff. Have you ever had friends borrow stuff? And I've had friends and family borrow tools and equipment and guess what? 
They've forgotten that they've ever borrowed it. And in fact, I've had times where I've said, hey, do you have this? Do you have that? I know they do. And they will look at me dumbfounded and say, no, we don't. And then later when they're cleaning out their garages or their sheds, guess what? They find it and they return it. And they expect to be applauded for returning what I loaned to them. <laughs> I'm just glad they found it because I probably bought another one because I, I've just given up. Now, when we think about what God has done to us and we return it and, and, and we give, you know, are we patting ourselves on the back or are we missing the point? You see, the Pharisees did that and Jesus condemned them. But he also reminded them that this is important. In Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, Malachi writes, Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, How have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions? You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Now think about that. You might be thinking that this curse, that if you're not giving to God, if you're not bringing to God, that you're under curse. And you are. I, I'm just going to say that. You are. And, and, but the, the idea of this word curse is misery. And what I find fascinating, and I, I've just put this together this week, and this is kind of like my, what do I say, my, my guess conjecture, my best conjecture, is this. Isn't it interesting that marriages have communication issues but before they have communication issues a lot of times they have financial issues and they fight over finances and 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 it's kind of miserable and because of the financial issues they have communications issues and then they have sexual or intimacy issues and what I find is that aren't they miserable and I've seen people who have made commitments to honor God in 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 bringing what is God's back to God, and it's revolutionized and changed and transformed their lives. And, and, and also, when we look at this idea of curse, I don't want you to equate this with, well, if I give, then I'm saved because I'm giving. No. You, you, you are saved by grace through faith. This is outside of that, and nothing can take away that salvation because it's of grace. We're not earning it. We don't deserve it. But I want you to, to realize that you can be miserable and you can be saved. And you all know people that are like that, don't you? They're saved people. They love the Lord, but they're miserable. And if you're going through life in misery, you might want to ask yourself a question. And I've had other people say to me, when I preach sermons like this, they'll say, well, I'm a New Testament Christian. I'm not an Old Testament Christian. And I ask them this. Now, if Jesus were here today, and if he told you to tithe, would you? Would you? Now, I want you to see two times in the New Testament where Jesus talks about this, and he endorses the tithe. Two times. He says this. If you will, look in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 23, 23. Jesus says, and this is red letters, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin. And what, what he's talking about here is out of their herb garden, he, they would give their tithe because they tithe on everything and have neglected. And notice, he prioritizes this, the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness which are weightier. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So what he's saying is, tithe, but realize there's spiritual things that are more important, but this is what you should do. And then in Luke 11, chapter, or chapter 11, verse 42, Jesus in red letters again, and he's talking to the scribes and Pharisees because they practiced this, but they were missing it. But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So he's saying, yes, yes. 
So again, when someone borrows from you and pays you back, do you congratulate them? And the answer is no. You're just grateful that it's back. But God says move beyond the tithe, to move to justice, to move to mercy, to move to love, to move to faithfulness. Move beyond that. Jesus says tithe as well as it is taught throughout Scripture. So he doesn't let us off the hook. He commends it and says, continue, but to raise it up and do more. Now let me ask you a question. Since I'm meddling today, where do you, you, where do I want the first portion of my paycheck to go to? Do I want it to go to the IRS because they will bless me? Or do I want it to go to God? Because He will bless me. You know, in Scripture, tithing is the only place where we are told to test God. And I want to challenge you to test God. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 says this, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Now, when we talk about this blessing till there's no more need, a lot of times we think it's going to be financial, and a lot of times it is, but not always. Sometimes it's health. Sometimes it's just well-being. Sometimes it's peace without misery. And I can share with you over and over again in my life how things have occurred randomly in my life that I couldn't have predicted. I've made deals that are unbelievable. God has allowed so many things to happen. But, but, but let me tell you, that it's been a, been a struggle for me because when I was younger, I was a youth pastor, and I'd see kids that were going without or needed something or needed to go on a trip, and I know, know CJ sees that, and we try to fund his budget as much as we possibly can so the kids have what they need, and John's budget so the kids have what they need. But I would see kids, and I would give my giving to them to be able to do some things instead of giving it into the storehouse. And I got convicted. I, I heard some teaching just like I'm teaching you today. And, and it just burned me up. And it changed my heart. And when I changed and put it where it was supposed to go, because I don't dictate where God's stuff is supposed to go. He dictates it to me. It, it transformed my life. And it transformed our finances. And it changed, changed us. Somebody guessed that I was about 10 years younger than I was. And he wasn't trying to be uh, complimentary. He said, well, you're well preserved. <laughs> and somebody else said last week in our first service, he, he, he said to, this guy said to me, and he's been attending church for a couple years, and I don't know where they came from, but he said to me, you know, this is a really healthy church. And I smiled and I said, yeah, it is. We really are blessed of God. And uh, I said, I'm not making that up. We've got some great leaders and we've got some things that God has done. We're blessed. You know, God wants to bless us and uh, he loves you. He loves me. But, but we've got to put it in his hands. The, the following verse that I was reading about blessing, it says, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. You see, there's a devourer. Now I'm now I'm crackling. I don't know what Is that helping. There you go. I, it's in the mic. It's in the mic. Um Do you ever feel like your financial situation is getting devoured in your life? Do you ever feel like, well, finally, I've got a windfall. Something's happened. I've got a check. Something's happened. 
and then all of a sudden something happens and, and it's all gone. That's the devourer. And, and I believe that that's not the Lord. I think that's Satan. But God puts a hedge around what we have. And, and that's his blessing. And he promises this, and you can bank on this, even in an inflationary down market, that God promises that 90% with God is more than 100% on your own. God will do that. And I can attest to that. And, and there are people scattered throughout this congregation that know this and live this out and bless others all the time. You see, when you tithe, God says, I see you acknowledge my ownership. You want to put me first. Now I can bless your situation. And I promise that 90% with me goes further than 100% with you. That's what he says. And I just want, want you to know that I hear two stories all the time. One is the story of misery and how life doesn't work and how hard it is and how God doesn't seem to be present. And I just wonder. I don't normally say anything, but, but I just wonder. And then I hear people that say, God is good. It's unbelievable. I don't know how I've ended up this way, but I am so blessed. I, I've received, I, I have given. It's unbelievable. See, it comes down to who owns it. Who am, putting, who am I putting first? And finally, the last transformative question is this. Who will I trust? Who will I trust? Will I trust God? with 90% or do I going to hold on to all of it and then I've got to manage it myself without God's blessing and allowing the devourer to come now in the beginning of this message I shared with you the Fugio scent that said mind your business the end of the message I just want you to think about the currency that the United States government prints off what does it say on it in God we trust. And I would say that we need to trust God because the times are uncertain. Things are just all over the place. But we need to trust Him first of all and most of all. And, and you can bank on His promise no matter what the market is. And my challenge today for you is will you put your faith and your trust and the one who loves you most of all and first of all. Will you please stand with me and pray? Eternal God and Father, again we come to you and Father, this is a hard for us to understand because it just doesn't make sense. It's supernatural, it's miraculous, and, and to realize that you want to bless us but at the same time, we have to acknowledge you in every area of our life and, and to put you first because you won't bless when you're not first. And Father, that's hard. It's hard to do. And I just pray that you'd give us an extra measure of your spirit, that you place a supernatural uh, fire for us to do what you desire us to do. And Father, we just praise you and we thank you in Jesus name.